Hello. Welcome to the first podcast in this new post-enlightenment series, The Cat's Out of the Bag. Well, you're probably going to wonder what post-enlightenment means. And I'll define it technically, and then I'll define it (laughs) from a a user's point of view. Um, Technically, enlightenment in Theravada Buddhism means attainment of fourth path. First, second, third path are degrees of enlightenment, but fourth path means arhant. It means attainment of nibbana, nirvana. It means that one does not have to return to birth and death. It means that one has full freedom as far as becoming in the universe. It also means one has full freedom not to become if that is one's desire or intention. Now, from an individual's point of view, it means that I went through a lot of learning, thinking, contemplation, reflection, analysis, and then I did a lot of practice. I did a lot of sitting, concentration, meditation. And when the path realizations happen, they happen by themselves. You can't make them happen but you can prepare yourself for them. And then when they happen, there are specific symptoms given in the scriptures, in the sutras, so you can recognize them and acknowledge them. Because the first thing you're going to think after you get one of these realizations is, yeah, that was it. Then the second thing is, was that really it? And of course, everyone will be happy to tell you, no, that wasn't really it, you're not really enlightened, blah, blah, blah. So post-enlightenment means, in a sense, to defend one's enlightenment. Uh, Of course, (laughs) one knows well there's nothing to defend. But since the aim of becoming enlightened, at least for a bodhisattva, is to become qualified to help other people attain enlightenment, then enlightenment is really just the beginning of the bodhisattva path. It might be the conclusion of the arahant path, but it's the beginning of the bodhisattva path. So after enlightenment, one stays in the world as long as one wishes to help people. So to do this, one has to be prepared to defend one's enlightenment. Now, the thing about enlightenment is there are so many ways to achieve it, so many ways to approach it. And of course, nobody can argue what is enlightenment. There's only one enlightenment. It's the enlightenment. Either you have it or you don't. Either you got it or recognize it, or you don't got it and you can't recognize it. Because until you experience it yourself, there's no way that you can say, even about yourself, that you're enlightened or not. What to speak of somebody else? We're not mind readers. Admit it. Everything is external. So on the basis of external symptoms, people are making judgments about who's enlightened and who's not. Of course, it's completely (laughs) impossible, (laughs) completely wrong. They'll get wrong results every time. And So what happens is people start to accept or reject a person's claim to enlightenment based on their organizational or religious standing their prestige in society and in their particular group, their influence, their popularity, in other words. So 
if <laughs> enlightenment becomes democratic, it means that the only people who we accept as enlightened are the ones who happen to be popular. <laughs> and of course, that's ridiculous. That's totally unscientific. Enlightenment by majority vote is bound to be a disaster. But that's what we've got. And if someone claims to be enlightened, whether he's popular or not, someone is always going to criticize, well, you can't get enlightened that way. You can't get enlightened. You're not qualified to be enlightened. So you can't become enlightened. Of course, all this is nonsense. Anyone can become enlightened. Everyone is already enlightened, according to Mahayana anyway. Everyone's already a Buddha. The only thing is we're hiding it from ourselves by these mental shields that we've created called I, mine, and so on. Everything based on ego, identity, self, I am. So as soon as we look into this even a little bit, of course, it starts to fall apart. And in the end, we, we have to admit that ego, self, I, identity, is a conceit. It's a self-imposed or self-applied label that is then rationalized indirectly by, by indirect reasoning to exist. Okay, well, so you can't really know if another person is enlightened or not. Because there's no one standard of external activities to determine that. For example, you look at an enlightened person like Saraha, a tantrika, or Bodhidharma, uh, who went to China and started uh, Chan Buddhism, which later became Zen. Or you look at somebody like uh, Ananda, Buddha's personal assistant, and you look at their styles of enlightenment, and they're all completely different. Their behavior, their mood, their customs, their philosophy, everything is different. Buddha is just sitting there and responding spontaneously to people around him. But yet there were all these scholars and academics like Ananda and Sariputta who wanted to write everything down. The Buddha said, no, don't write it down. You simply hear, be here and listen. But then, of course, as soon as Buddha disappeared, what's the first thing they did? Wrote it all down. And then the scholars get a hold of it. And, of course, the scholars want to make Buddha seem like he's superhuman. So they build up all these legends and all these fables and fairy tales, and people actually believe them. And then they start comparing, and then they say, well, you, can you compare to Buddha? Can you do what Buddha did? Yeah, but 90% of what is ascribed to Buddha is probably not what the Buddha actually said or did. It's been edited. It's been embellished. It's been mythologized. It's been aggrandized, extravagant to the limit and beyond. Some of the Mahayana scriptures, my God, they're so flowery. They're impossible. And all of that gets in the way of the point. And the point in Buddha's teaching is emptiness, nothingness. If you have this realization, you can see it in others. If you don't, there's no way you can. So, to judge enlightenment based on external characteristics is wrong. It always leads to false results, false positives and false negatives. We may think any very prominent powerful, popular person in society is enlightened, a god or goddess, a leader, someone to help us solve all our problems. But of course, that's wrong. And conversely, we might think that someone who doesn't display those symptoms, someone who, for example, is very solitary or very quiet or not very popular or even very unpopular, infamous, uh, who has a bad reputation in society, we think, oh, that person could never be enlightened. Or someone who achieved enlightenment by a different door, 
Remember, there's 86,000 Dharma doors, according to the Buddha. So of the 86,000, how many do we know about? How many have we personally tried? So to criticize someone who claims enlightenment by saying the method that you attained enlightenment with is wrong, is completely bogus. So why am I talking about this? Well, in 1993, the Dalai Lama called a conference of 22 Buddhist leaders and teachers in the West. And he, along with three other very high-ranking Tibetan lamas, basically told the group of teachers, Western teachers, that you cannot teach Tantra. Westerners aren't qualified for it. It's all turning out very badly. And of course, this was in response to the debacle surrounding Chogyang Trungpa and his followers and his successor. And so they made it a law, they made it a rule that uh, everyone who teaches Buddhism, quote unquote, has to follow at least the five major lay precepts. And among those is no inappropriate sexual relations. But who gets to decide what is inappropriate? Let me ask you. Well, when the Dalai Lama was pressed later on uh, to define this term. He basically said the only kind of appropriate sexual relations are those which are intended to produce offspring. That's the same that the Pope is going to tell you, the same that any priest is going to tell you, any, any Muslim imam, <laughs> anybody who belongs to an Abrahamic religion or Hinduism or Buddhism is going to tell you sex is incompatible with enlightenment. Well, then what is this Tantra tradition that has existed for thousands and thousands of years? Huh? What is that all about? It's just a different door. There has to be a door for people, beings of every description, of every mentality of every nature. Why? Because enlightenment is universal. If enlightenment is not available to any group of beings, it would not be ultimate enlightenment. Think about that. So the enlightenment that's available through the path of, let's say, classical uh, eightfold path Buddhism, that enlightenment is just exactly the same enlightenment as the enlightenment through Zen, or the enlightenment through Tantra, or the enlightenment through whatever way you approach it. Enlightenment is always the same. Otherwise, it wouldn't be enlightenment. It wouldn't be absolute. It wouldn't be universal. It wouldn't be true. It would be a false enlightenment. So, I assert that I attained fourth path on August 13th, 2015, aboard an airliner on its landing approach to Dubai at midnight. I had no idea that it was going to happen. It surprised me very much. I was probably more surprised than anybody especially wandering around Dubai airport at two in the morning, <laughs> waiting for my next flight. Like, wow, did that really happen? Yeah, that, that just happened. Because another reason why I strongly resist any criticism of an enlightened person based on their externals is that when I attained first path back in 1984, I also had no idea. <laughs> it was a complete surprise because I knew almost nothing about Buddhism. And I was being guided by a tantric master, Osho. And under his influence and inspiration, 
I experienced something, many things that I had never experienced before. But without any conscious strategy, just by sitting down and watching, just looking, just being a witness. So all these elaborate plans to approach self-realization by this way, by that way, by the other way, all these methods, all of these uh, cut and dry theoretical approaches, when they work, which is rare, (laughs) because we don't let them work, when they work, they bring us to the spontaneous phase. See, there's enlightenment by methodology and then there's enlightenment spontaneously. Okay? The enlightenment by methodology is only the preparatory stage. The actual enlightenment is spontaneous. It just happens to you. You can't make it happen. Although there are things you can do to prepare for it to happen. So, all right. If that's the case, then... When we get to a certain stage in meditation, our enlightenment, or our awareness rather, increases to the point where we can spontaneously see what we need to do. What needs to be done to approach the next level, or the next realization, or the next stage of enlightenment. It simply arises in our minds due to our intention to approach enlightenment. And this can be anything. It doesn't have to be the next thing in your book. That book was written by somebody else about their journey to enlightenment. Just like my books and videos and whatnot are about my journey to enlightenment. That's going to be different from your journey to enlightenment. The door you go through may not be the door that your teacher went through. Or that some popular person or author went through. It might be a door that nobody even knows about anymore. Because nobody has a list of those 86,000 doors. You may find a way into enlightenment that nobody else has found. And I think many people have. But then later on, they lose uh, faith in their own experience. They begin to doubt their own experience. And I did also. After I got first path in 84... For a long time, I doubted it. I doubted that I had achieved anything because I doubted my teacher. Osho was a very controversial figure, and in particular, his last few years were very rough, ragged, difficult, hard for people to understand what he was trying to do. Uh, I'm only beginning myself now to understand really what he was up to. At the time, I couldn't make any sense of it. So I doubted. And it wasn't until I went deep into the Buddhist sutras and I found out the actual description of Nirvana, of the path realizations, that I realized, holy cow, that was the real thing. He did guide me the right way. He really was enlightened. And so that brings up the actual symptom of a realized person. And what is that? He does his best to help others become realized. And I think uh, since even before my enlightenment, I was always dedicated to helping people understand to helping people uh, see things the right way, which, after all, is the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path, right view. Because people don't have right view, they're not getting the results from their sadhana. They're not getting the uh, different symptoms of enlightenment, internal symptoms. Or if they are, they don't recognize them because of a lack of knowledge. So I've done my best to make that knowledge available. If you've gone through any of the hundred or so videos on this channel, then you know there's something there. 
You can't deny it. I know what I'm talking about. I know it. You know it. And it's coming from experience. It's not out of a book. Yeah, in the past I've used texts to teach from, and I probably will again. But ultimately it's about the relationship between the seeker and the master. Especially for Tantra. The relationship with the master is the path. So, I know Tantra is unpopular now. The Dalai Lama has issued his edict, uh, his proclamation that Westerners can't study or teach Tantra. But I didn't learn it from the Tibetans. I learned Tantra from, from my mother, from Native Americans, from people, uh, Shaivites in Kashmir, and from the Chinese. Uh, I'm actually initiated in a Chinese lineage. I was a monk in a Chinese lineage from 1974. So, I know what I'm talking about. I know where this stuff comes from. I know the history of it and all. So the stuff I'm teaching is not anything bad. It's not anything wrong. A few years back, a couple of my disciples at that time asked me to teach them Tantra. So I taught them. And unfortunately, there was a jealous disciple who stole the information, the photographs and so on, and tried to use them to blackmail me into giving him money. It's called extortion. It's a crime. It's a crime everywhere in the world. But he fled India before he could be charged. So now this same person is spreading all kinds of lies about me, making up a story that I seduced or otherwise misused my power as a teacher to get those students to do Tantra. But no, they asked me. And in fact, it happened in public. It happened at a meeting of all my disciples on my birthday. So there are plenty of witnesses. So the stories that are spread about me are false. And they're very misleading. And if you actually study this information that I'm presenting, if you actually go into it and experience it, you'll see there's something to it. You'll experience for yourself. I'm not asking you to believe in me. But I'm asking you to try. Try the things I recommend. And if they work for you, great. And if they don't, just drop it. There's no need to become an enemy. There's no need to go around making nasty posts about me on social media. There's no need to go mailing uh, revenge porn to people whenever I try to give a class in a certain area. Uh, there's no need to do that. Why are they doing that? Why are so-called Buddhists doing illegal things to stop me from teaching? Well, they're going to have to answer that question themselves in the appropriate uh, venue when the time comes. But what I want you to look at right now is, well, why do you suppose that these people might be interested in stopping my teaching? Is it that there are already bleeding disciples and money like anything and they're afraid they're going to lose their audience and their credibility in the Buddhist community? Because that's what's happening. Nobody really believes in that consensus that was arrived at back in 93. And why not? Because nobody is becoming enlightened. If their disciples were becoming enlightened, everything would be fine, everything would be great. But they're not. No, just people like me are becoming enlightened. Outliers, outsiders. Huh? The infamous, the condemned, the rejected. Those people are becoming enlightened. But the ones who go to college and earn fancy degrees in Buddhism, they're not becoming enlightened. 
They're becoming religious functionaries with boring desk jobs. So, if you want the real enlightenment, if you want to do the best you can for yourself, don't become a part of one of these groups. They all start to get involved in religious politics. The power goes to their heads. They start doing destructive, harmful things. Dalai Lama says, my religion is kindness. Well, if you're going to be so kind, then please stop your dogs from ruining my life with their black propaganda. Thank you very much.